Hello and welcome everyone. It's so nice to have so many of you all join us for our, today's webinar. If you're here to talk about how to support your colleagues and students during collective trauma, you're in the right place with the right people. We're going to allow for just a few moments for more of our colleagues to join in live and then we're going to get started. So if you'll just give us a moment, but while we're getting comfy and settling into the Zoom room, if you wanna drop a note in the chat and say hello, tell us where you're from, what institution or organization you're repping, um, we'd love to hear from you. And a reminder to send your chats to all attendees and panelists so that everybody can see it. When you send it only to panelists, other attendees aren't able to see it. All right, it's so great to see so many of our colleagues joining in live. We have uh, St. Catherine University in St. Paul, Minnesota. We have the University of Northern Colorado, of course, ACC in my backyard here in Austin, Texas. So nice to see our local people here. We have the Scholarship Foundation of St. Louis. Welcome, welcome. More Austin, I see a lot of Texas folks. It's nice to see y'all here. <laughs> St. Phillips College from San Antonio, Texas, St. Mary's. CSU Long Beach from TRIO, love TRIO programs. I am a TRIO alum, love to see y'all here. Thanks for joining us. Madison College, Oakwood University. It's nice to have you here. The University of Houston downtown, University of Kansas. Our Lady of the Lake, good afternoon, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. So nice to see so many of you here from Ohio, Alabama. We have the UNT Health Center from Fort Worth, Texas. So great. We also have a Trellis Foundation board member joining us today. Welcome, Alma. It's so nice to have you here. UNC Chapel Hill. This is great. College Hub uh, Foundation Communities, nice to have you here. This is fantastic. If you're sending us a chat, remember to send it to all panelists and attendees so that all the other attendees can see the chat too and see where you're uh, coming in from and where you're repping. We'd love to see you all. It's so great to see so many actually familiar names and, and not faces. Sadly, we can't see you, but to see a lot of familiar names and some unfamiliar ones, but it's so great to have you all here in our, in our virtual Zoom room community. This is so great. So we're going to give it just another 30 seconds and then we will get started. But in the meantime, keep dropping your hellos, keep repping your institution, tell us where you're from. We see Alcorn State, so nice to have you here. Rutgers, Mission College from Santa Clara. It's so nice to see so many of you all here. Also, if you hear any screaming children in the back, please excuse me. We're trying, we're trying to keep them quiet for this webinar, but it's a little hard to keep them under, under control. Okay, so I think we are, we have a good number of participants here live with us. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, all right. I think we're all set up, we're all ready to go. So again, everyone, welcome and hello. My name is Sana Megani. If this is your first time joining us for our self-care webinar series, it's okay not to be okay, welcome. If this is, uh, you're coming back, welcome back. I'm so glad that you decided to come back and to join us for one more session. This is a four-part uh, self-care webinar series for our uh, professionals of color in the higher ed space, not just those of us that are at higher ed institutions, but also those of our colleagues who are in uh, the community and who are at the, in the nonprofit space. So we're so happy to have you all here. Uh, this webinar series is made possible by Trellis Company and um, 
Trellis Foundation. I'm going to read a little bit about both Trellis Company and Trellis Foundation, and then we will get started with today's topic. So Trellis Company is a 501c3 nonprofit with nearly 40 years of history working to promote access and success in higher education. The Community Investment Division, where I work, provides services to students, institutions, and policymakers. Trellis, and we also um, uh, work with Trellis Foundation, who is our sister organization, and this series is made possible by them. The foundation focuses on improving attainment for low to moderate income students as they pursue post-secondary credentials and degrees in the state of Texas. As I stated earlier, this uh, particular webinar is on supporting our colleagues and students of color during times of collective trauma. It has, since we last met, if you came to our last webinar, a lot has transpired in our communities. And we talked about this last time, but it almost feels like you're just barely getting done with mourning or grieving one thing and you're hit with another. Um, what, you know, many of us are facing a lot of, uh, you know, varying challenging circumstances. We may be facing job insecurity, risk of eviction, losing our homes and loved ones and fires and hurricanes and COVID, all while experiencing racial trauma and showing up for our students, for our communities, for our colleagues, all in the middle of an election season. So it's a lot, we're experiencing a lot. There's heightened anxiety. There's a residual racial trauma that we experience as people of color. And we're here to talk about all of that. And I'm so glad that you're able to join us. But before we get to talking about trauma and what it means to support each other during collective trauma, I just wanna say that one thing that is keeping me going is also celebrating the small wins and successes in my community and in my uh, group and circle of friends. So today I wanted to announce that Lexi, who is our, one of our guest speakers and the co-creator for this webinar series, she is officially an LPC. Uh, so if you had seen her title previously, it said LPC intern. It is now official. It is legit. She is not an intern. Lexi has put in hours and hours of work over the last several years with three young kids to make this happen. I am so proud of her. Um, she is a sister and a friend and I've seen her ride that struggle bus all the way through. And so um, I'm really, really proud of her. I, I mean, I am tearing up because I'm so proud of how far she's come, but celebrating her gives me joy, celebrating small wins and successes, despite how challenging this time and season is for so many of us. Uh, is what's keeping me going. So tell us uh, in the comments, what is bringing you joy? What is keeping you going? Who are you celebrating today? And, and by the way, you can celebrate yourself. Getting out of bed and getting a cup of coffee and showing up to join us today is a win. So if you are celebrating yourself, let's do it. Send us a chat. Uh, let us know. Remember to send it to all panelists and attendees and let us know what it is that's keeping you going right now. How are you staying afloat? What are, how are you surviving? And if it's about celebrating someone, let us know. We want to celebrate them with you. And while you do that, I'm going to hand it over to Alexi and Como to do a quick hello and introduction. Hi, good afternoon. I guess good afternoon now, right? Um, I'm so glad to be here again with all of you. I wish I could see all of your faces, um, but please, yes, I want to see what you're celebrating too, because it is so necessary for us to have a moment of celebration with each other. But thank you for joining us and, and coming with us today on this journey. Hi, my name is Dr. Komal Chandra. I am a residence coordinator at New Jersey Institute of Technology. My PhD is in urban systems focusing on health. And um, I'm so happy that you're taking time for you. Um, for yourself and your self-care and professional development and sharing your time with us. So thank you so much for being here today and share those accomplishments. Awesome, so we're going to share the slide deck and kick off our webinar. If you have questions during our webinar, feel free to use the Q&A section. Um, the comment is full, uh, the chat section is full of comments and chat. And so sometimes it's hard to keep track of questions there. But if you have um, a, you know, a question, send it to the Q&A. We'll try do our best to address it at the end. If not, you'll have our contact information and can certainly reach out to us at the end um, or after the webinar is over. But today we're going to practice a uh, mindful meditation. Lexi, who has been leading us through those, will do it again. Uh, we're going to understand the impacts of trauma. We're going to gain self-awareness around needs. We're going to learn methods and strategies to support students and colleagues during collective trauma. 
and we're going to understand how to make meaning of trauma after an event is over. Uh, so again, keep the comments going. Let's keep engaging with, with each other in the chat, but I'm going to hand it over to our amazing and talented uh, guest speakers here today. And I'll be still here on the chat. So let me know if you need anything from me. All right. So we're going to get started again today. We're going to start with just a meditation. I'm going to turn my video off and this one's going to be a little shorter because we have some, some good content for you guys today. And we want to be sure we have time for it. But it's also really important for you to take a moment and remember why you're here and get comfortable. Put both feet on the floor and breathe in through your nose for four and then see if you can breathe out for eight. So just breathe in and out. And find comfort with us here today. Today, even if it's just for this hour, you may release your attachment to things that no longer serve you. Breathe. Whenever your mind wanders now, or maybe even during the webinar, it's okay. Come back to your breath and breathe. When you inhale, inhale confidence and joy. Exhale doubt and agitation. Breathe. Let us support you so you can support others. Breathe. May you honor your need to rest, connect, and recharge to continue on in the hardest of times. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes, you can stretch, and you can come back to us. So I felt that today this quote was very important as you learn how to support yourself, support others, support your students, support your colleagues, support your employees. And so uh, Dr. Maya Angelou has said, has said, I have learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And that is so important as you explore your own feelings around this pandemic, this racial pandemic, election season, uh, Supreme Court justice appointment. How are people making you feel right now? How is your boss making you feel? How are the students reacting to you? So it's so important. We always remember how someone is making us feel and never forget that. Como? So I wanted to start us off by talking about what is collective trauma. Um, we are dealing with it right now. And not only are we dealing with one pandemic, I think that we're simultaneously dealing with two pandemics, not only a health pandemic with COVID, but also a racial pandemic. And this affects your health in so many different areas. So we decided to focus on the eight dimensions of wellness by SAMHSA and realize that COVID, this pandemic, and this trauma is affecting all areas um, for your students, your staff, your colleagues, and yourself whether that's emotionally, uh, you're worried about relationship strains, um, health of your family members, financially, job security, bills, groceries, uh, medical costs, socially, maybe is it safe to see my friends? Um, am I missing birthdays? Am I missing the opportunity to go to funerals even? Um, spiritually, what is happening? Um, physically, gyms might be closed and access to food may be difficult during this time. Um, Intellectually, I know I suffer from COVID brain fatigue. Um, things are a struggle right now. And environmentally, um, keeping yourself safe. I never had anxiety going to the grocery store or even going out for a walk before. So realize that this trauma is affecting everybody and it's affecting everybody collectively and in different ways as well. Um, but realize that health and wellness is not linear. So when you're talking about how 
to support others, realize that things could be good one day and not good the other day. Um, maybe election anxiety, you are, feel like you're in control and you see a different post or news and now you're stressed and emotional or now you think you might be exposed that could affect you and your colleagues and staff differently. So um, realize that all of these things that you're dealing with, everybody is also experiencing the same, but we could just be coping differently or expressing ourselves differently um, during this time. Can we go to the next slide? Um, supporting yourself. So before you can help others, you want to make sure that you're supporting yourself first. You can't pour from an empty cup. We know that. And you wouldn't let your get phone get to this point of uh, needing to find and run for a charger. Um, don't let that happen to you and don't let that happen to your energy. So as soon as my phone hits that 20% low energy mode, I don't wait for my phone to die. Don't wait for your energy to do the same. Make sure you're taking time um, to ground yourself because that affects the energy that you're giving off to others when you're trying to support them. Um, so reminder and recap, I know some of our previous Trellis webinars and Trellis Foundation webinars have talked about how to support yourself and mindfulness for yourself and grounding for yourself. I encourage you to go and watch them. If you need um, other tips and tricks, you can reach out to us. But um, do consider grounding yourself before helping others, practicing self-care, um, and letting go and releasing your emotions when you're um, helping others. So self-awareness, how do you do that? Uh, check in with yourself. How are you feeling? Are you tense? Have you eaten? These are really good questions to ask yourself daily. Um, we're going to click next. I think it's going to go one by one. There we go. Practice mindfulness. Um, when you walk into a meeting or when you enter a Zoom call or a WebEx call, are you taking in the surroundings? Are you looking at people's expressions, emotions? Are you reading into them or are you just kind of rushing through everything? Um, incorporating those grounding exercises. Um, sometimes during the middle of the Zoom call, I'll take my shoes off for a second, stretch, um, walking, listening to music, humming, as Lexi shared with us previously, is fantastic. Um, counting, meditation, all of these can help ground you before you go to help and support others. Um, setting boundaries is extremely important. Um, don't call me after 5 p.m., 6 p.m. because my phone is going to be off. That's family time. Or lunch might be off limits for you, or even five minutes of your door closed. Um, or if you don't have time, say, hey, can we schedule this meeting for later because I want to give you my full attention. Um, routinely releasing pent up energy and emotions, going for a run, a walk, a cry, a scream, ripping paper. I know that sounds crazy, but we do need to release that emotion that you're pent up, that you're holding on to, because we're really taking emotion from everybody, every incident, you know, every email. So how are you letting that emotion and energy go? And lastly, realize that self-care is a priority, not a luxury. You need to realize that you are important. And just as much as we tell others to take care of themselves, we need to do the same for us and realize it's not something that we need to go for a massage or a spa day, but what can you do and what can you incorporate daily for yourself? So I'd love in the chat if you could list what other things you do for self-care and maybe others can utilize that as inspiration. Thank you, Lexi. Sorry about that. So now uh, as we continue around self-awareness, we're just going to quickly touch on something we started talking about last time if you were present. Um, and if not, I think those slides are still available. Um, but we're also framing what we're experiencing through Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so if you start from the very bottom, these are our physiological needs. So air, water, food, do I have a roof over my head? Um, and then we move up from there. So once we have the bottom layer met, we can then try and move up to the next one. Then we can focus on safety, personal security. Do I, have a, do I still have my job? Um, are resources available to me? Next is love and belonging. That's, did you find your community? Are you finding your sense of community? Esteem, that's your self-esteem, finding meaning about maybe what you want to do in life, um, self-respect. Did you get that promotion that you were looking for? And then self-actualization, desire to become the most that one can be. And it's usually argued that we don't fully reach self-actualization, that that's that quest for purpose, our continue, we continue to try and make meaning 
of our experiences. So that is an ongoing thing. So at the very bottom, just to put it out there, it is, it is survival. Those physiological needs, that's a survival goal. So are you sleeping? These are questions to ask yourself. Do you have access to food and water on a daily basis? Do you have warmth, right? As we start getting into colder weather. Um, so interventions for this, if this is yourself, um, can, or can someone else offer food? Have you accessed a food bank? Do you need a shelter? Do you need to move in with a friend? Um, do you yourself have an extra room to offer if someone else is needing this? A safety goal. So questions to ask yourself, am I safe? Am I being hurt or abused? Maybe by someone that you love, maybe it's a colleague, maybe it's a manager. Am I experiencing racial discrimination? Um, that is also safety. That is very much a safety goal right now. And many of us don't feel safe. Um, is there routine? Is there consistency? If not, um, can someone help financially support you? Um, if it's violence, do you need to call 911? Do you need to call a family member? Do you need to reach out to a mental health professional? We want to be sure um, that you're meeting these goals because right now in this COVID season, uh, racial pandemic, this is ongoing, um, election season, many of us are not able to get past these two. This is every day. And so if you haven't eaten, if you're not sleeping and you're constantly worried about the future of our country, the future of your institution, the future of your nonprofit or your organization, we are stuck right here. And so when people say, why didn't you return my phone call? Uh, this is why, because you're tired. You have nothing left to give and you can't meet the next one, the, the acceptance and value-based goals. That's that love and belonging, um, maintaining meaningful connections, community, you need exposure to that. But when you can't meet the bottom two, you can't move up to the rest of them. So that's why these questions are so important to ask yourself. Um, like I said, sense of community, if you need a support group, perhaps that can help meet some of these goals. If you're alone, um, even a virtual hangout. I know we all have Zoom fatigue, but sometimes just touching base, face to face, to, face to face, FaceTime with someone can really help meet that need. Um, and then interest-based goals. Again, these are esteem. So having the opportunity to explore your interests, or maybe where you want to go in your job, how you want to serve others. Um, that could be maybe reading a book. Um, gaining new knowledge, um, taking a new class, organizing a book club. And again, do I have what I need to reach my full potential? This is ongoing. This is uh, lifelong opportunities for exploration. So these questions are going to be so important to ask yourself because if you don't ask yourself these questions, you're not going to be able to be present for other people. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what is it like to support others? And we are going to break it down in terms of students and colleagues and managers, but there are some things that are just general across the board that we all need to have in order to just support each other. I wanna take a second to shout out. This chat is amazing and I'm so thankful for how collaborative everyone is being. And there's some great ideas. I know I'm gonna take note of them also after this seminar. Um, so tips for supporting others overall. Um, step one, be mindful of toxic positivity. Um, uplifting the mood is great and is wonderful to support others, but be mindful of, you know, we're not business as usual. Everything is not okay and things might not be okay. And that's the reality that we're in in the moment. So be aware of your language. Is it being harmful to the well-being of your staff or students? Um, do you have examples of what colleagues have said that made you think, no, things are not okay at the moment? I know um, in terms of just, hey, we'll get through it, we always do, or things will be fine, or it's not that big of a deal. Um, it is. Uh, communicate and check in often. Make it a precedent to have a, an environment of, it's normal to check in and ask how your staff or colleagues or students are doing. How are you feeling today? Is it normal to ask if somebody's eaten? Is it normal to ask, what are you doing to take care of yourself? You know, do something maybe weekly, bi-weekly, set that intention up. You can also check in not only in person, but via text, an email, a web call. Um, it can be a quick conversation or it could be a longer conversation. Presence is a presence. Um, with that quote from Dr. Maya Angelou, 
People remember how you make them feel. So when you're speaking with them, be present, show them that they matter, that their feelings matter. Um, and that could be by removing some distractions, allowing some time to focus one-on-one -on, -one on that individual, utilizing that reflective listening, we're gonna talk about that, allowing someone to feel like you're being heard. Um, ask the other person what they need from you. I don't know if this has happened to you, but has one of your partners perhaps said something, you're talking about a fight that happened, whether it's at work or with friends, and they had the audacity to actually give you solutions and all you wanted to do was then. Um, sometimes you need to ask, you know, I wanna support you. What do you need from me at the moment? Do you want me to listen? Do you want me to provide solutions? Do we want, um, would you like some resources? So ask what is needed from you in that moment. And that really helps that person who needs to feel supported give, tell you what they need from you. And we did talk about um, reflective and active listening. So some things you could say are, what I hear you saying is, um, I wanna make sure I understand. Is this what you mean? So you're feeling overwhelmed. That's what I'm getting from your you know, conversation. Is that correct? Use those moments to clarify and help you understand how the other individual is feeling and by using those active listening techniques or those reflective techniques. That'll help you support others overall. So just a few more tips for supporting others. Again, assess using that hierarchy of needs. Remember those, those questions I asked you, like, where are you? Are you getting your needs met right now? If you can ask those questions and support others and asking them, hey, did you eat lunch today? Have you slept? How much sleep are you getting? Then you can at least find a way to support others um, and kind of get in there depending on what they need. So if you're texting them and wondering why they're not communicating, it could be that they're at the very bottom uh, of the pyramid, whereas you're maybe closer to the middle. So assess uh, using the hierarchy of needs. Personal boundaries, we've already covered. Um, they've been in other webinars. Just remember, create the boundary, state it, and maintain it. So you have to understand the why behind it. Consider cultural context. This is so important. Um, consider race, ethnicity. Um, are your colleagues, do they have kids right now? So I think like Sana had also said, like we both have screaming children on the other side of this door. So that could be why I can't support other people right now. So that also, are you living in an intergenerational household? That impacts how you can support others or support yourself. Um, citizenship, other caregiver responsibilities, sexual orientation, religion. So culture, again, is not just race, race and ethnicity, it covers so much more. So please make sure you're taking the time to understand that when you're trying to support your students, um, colleagues, or, or other employees. Rupture and repair. I talk about this a lot with my clients and I'm sure they're very tired of me talking about it. And I talk about it in my house and I'm sure everyone's tired of me talking about it, but it's so important. Um, and it shows up when you're infants and you don't even realize it. And it shows up in every single one of the relationships that you're in. And it's so important. Rupture is a break in connection with other people. And so a rupture can happen if so for instance, if Komal was speaking on the webinar and I had my phone up and I was texting, I'm like, oh, oh, sorry, that's a rupture because I wasn't connected with Komal, I wasn't connected with the audience. And so I would wanna seek to repair. So we, we rupture all the time, it's going to happen. Um, perhaps expectations were not met by a colleague. Perhaps you forgot to complete something or a form for a student, that can be considered a rupture as well. Um, so there are opportunities to repair on a daily basis. And they're kind of like gifts. I know it doesn't seem like it, but they are. Um, because what that does is it helps reinstill trust in the relationship that this person can come to you and say, I trust you. Um, and so the repair is the effort that you put into recognizing what happened, right? So you have to put that effort in. You want to give the other person a chance to share how they felt about it. So they're allowed to say that they felt disappointed that they feel frustrated um, and then communicate how you are going to change the behavior or act differently in the future and then show them that's the repair. So remember, we're going to rupture. It's going to happen. It happens in all our relationships, but that repair is so important that 
I am so sorry that I didn't take the time out when you were trying to speak to me directly about your problem. This is how I'm going to change that behavior in the future. Okay, so make sure you focus on that rupture and repair. Follow up. Don't forget to follow up with the people you said you're going to follow up with. Uh, maybe send summary emails from meetings that you had just so people know that you're listening. Um, and assess risk. So on the next two slides, and you'll get a copy of the slides so we won't talk about them. Um, you'll see that this is a great risk assessment tool that you can use with colleagues, with students, um, when you're in crisis or any other critical situation. And so it allows you to just get an idea of where people might be. So if you look at uh, zero to one, which is mild, all the way up to critical, these are some of the behaviors you might see in another student or a colleague. Um, and then on this screen too, and we included it in the resources so you can get a copy. Um, this can help you with intervention. So what can I possibly do in this moment if, for instance, the behaviors are mild, if they're elevated? Um, this just gives you an idea of what you might be able to do with your students and colleagues. So again, that's gonna be in the resources slide. So what we did is overall, those were tips for helping and supporting others in general. Now we're gonna break it down into supporting students and then colleagues and then staff in general. So um, when talking about students, it's important to realize that students are our equals. Um, they are adults. I know that we can often think that, you know, we're dealing with young, young adults, but they are adults. Um, reciprocate that respect and kindness and see the person beyond the student. Realize that they might know more than you about a specific area. They also have a history, they have experiences, they have their own strengths as well. Um, we do often see them as kids, but you know, as adults, they're also processing. They're also stressed out and scared and navigating the same trauma that you are. Um, maybe they're picking up more. Maybe they're helping out somebody who's sick at home, maybe helping with siblings. Maybe they've also lost somebody. Um, and they might not have as much experience as we do. So realize that the first step is to see beyond the student, see who they are, see who their life experiences are, create that connection that'll allow them to reciprocate and to also accept the support that you're giving forward. Things you can do. Try to keep to schedule meetings and appointments. That gives a sense of consistency, especially for this generation, things that are regimented. I know when I'm supposed to meet someone, I know what's expected of me helps with keeping some type of normalcy during this time. Um, explain as much as you can, decisions, options, alterations, or changes in the plan. That understanding and that communicating helps somebody understand that you're not just dropping the ball or you didn't just cancel this appointment because you don't want to meet with me because I'm not important. Something came up and you're rescheduling with me and you're telling me that I'm important. Um, some offices are having survival kits or care packages during this time. A little sense of here's something to help you with self-care, um, whether that's vitamin C packs, tissues, sanitizer, lip balm, pens, pencils, something small, but something to say, I see you, I wanted to put this together for you. Or do you have something grab and go in your office to help with if, you, if your offices are open um, and traffic is coming through? Um, how do you just show that you're giving a little bit of care for your students? Lastly, have a resource list ready. So um, are you, you know, resourcing out to counseling services? Do you have their number, email address, location handy? Tutoring center, group therapy, advisors. There's so many, you know, different, whether there's entities or options that you're gonna resource out to, have that list ready. That helps you support others better because you know what maybe students are gonna be needing more of. Having it ready avoids you having to do that work and search for that information afterwards. Um, things that will help with supporting students specifically. Ask open-ended questions. Often when we try to build a connection with the student, we say, hey, how are things going? And the student replies, good, great, okay, bye. And that's it. So ask beyond that. You know, what's been your toughest class and why? Oh, and then they love to complain about this is why this has been so, you know, a struggle. People do want to open up. Sometimes we need to ask the right question or delve a little bit deeper. Ask about those eight dimensions of wellness. How have you been sleeping? How have you been eating? How are you coping about what's going on right now? What's most stressful to you? 
oh, I didn't know that you're caring for your sibling at this time. That must be tough. How does that feel? Um, ask if they're connected. Being connected is one of the greatest sources of stress relief and uh, care during trauma. So are these students connected to resources on campus, different services that your universities or institutions apply, uh, have available, clubs, friends, and if they aren't, find ways to connect them. And if we go to the next slide, these are some examples of questions that you can ask. What have you been doing to de-stress recently? Does it help? Is it working for you? Have you been eating and sleeping recently? What brings you joy? What's been stressing you out? And what do you need to incorporate more of to increase your wellness? There's also a way you can gauge. I just posted on my Instagram today, what's your stress level? You know, are we at a zero to 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 75? It can become slightly comical, but at least it gives people a moment to open up and check in. And once you make this a precedent, it's not weird that you're asking about self-care. It helps show that you care about the student or the person behind the student and that it's normal for you to want to check in on their well-being. Thanks, Lexi. So now let's talk a little bit about supporting each other. Um, this can be one of the hardest things, supporting your peer. Um, and so you really don't know how someone is doing until you take the time to ask. And the same question remains of when you know when you ask someone, well, how how are you doing? Most of us just want to say, okay or fine, um, it reminds me of an, an SNL character where all he does is say, okay, and I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's how we respond because we don't wanna be honest and say how we're actually doing. Um, so I'd like to know if you're in the chat or chatting with each other, what's been the hardest part for each of you as it pertains to supporting a peer? All right, so not your boss, even if your boss is a peer, but I'm in just like your friend or other colleagues that are about the same level as you, depending on where you work? What's been the hardest part about this? Um, so again, you don't know how someone's doing until you ask, get to know your peers. Do they live alone? Do they have children? Are they single or do they have a partner or more, multiple partners? Are there multiple generations living together in one house? Could you imagine, I know I grew up early on, in an intergenerational household. Um, and so I had my grandmother in the house, I had aunts in the house, my brothers, I had cousins, and it was always chaos. And I could not imagine, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to do the work that I do now in that type of house, but also being held to the same expectations. And what happens when we're all experiencing trauma or you're experiencing a crisis with where you work, but you also have to manage either children, a partner, um, grandma, aunt, sister, and try and meet everybody's needs. So it's important that you understand maybe what your peer is, is going through and see if you can help them. Do they have access to um, like a quiet space to be able to work? Can you help offer that if everyone's, if you feel comfortable on the same kind of quarantine pod, if you're still working from home, um, if you're working together on campus, what can you do to help support them? Um, some work buddy accountability. Um, I don't know if you ever heard the term like an accountability buddy. Um, so everybody needs an accountability buddy. I have some, they always text and check in on me to see how I'm doing. So pair up with another coworker who might be in your office and establish set times to check in. So that way you don't feel maybe offended if someone's checking in with you too much. Establish those set check-in times and establish questions that are okay to ask that aren't off limits. Sometimes things are off limits and you don't wanna talk about it. You don't wanna to delve too deep. I think it's absolutely okay and it's safe to say and state, these are things I don't really feel comfortable talking about, but anything else is fair game. Um, and that is part of establishing safety. That's establishing a safe environment to have a conversation. Um, also disclosure. So making sure that if there is something um, like depending on your role. So if you're a mandated reporter and you're also paired up with someone, does that mean you, you can't hear certain things because you're mandated to report? So that's also very important to take into consideration. Non-defensive listening. There's always something that triggers all of our defenses and they go up and you can feel it and you're just ready to attack and you just wanna defend yourself and you wanna be heard and that's it. When you're with a peer, it's so important to recognize that this might be the one place that they feel comfortable. 
that they feel safe during the day to just express how they're feeling. So remember, if you're within your window of tolerance, and we've talked about that before too, you have a better chance of helping your colleague also get within their window of tolerance. And that's part of non-defensive listening. Be curious. Remember to listen to understand. You're not listening to respond. You're just listening to see if there's any way that maybe you can support them later on as they're done speaking. Um, let them know that you'll continue to hold them in your thoughts, even if you can't solve a problem, but maybe there's something that you can go back to later on. So other questions when you're supporting colleagues, very specific. How have you been in the last seven days? How are you today? Right, because normally if we're like, oh, if I were to think about today, I'm okay. Well, I woke up, had some coffee, I'm feeling good. But if I were to look at the last seven days, I don't, some things may have gone down. It may have been rough. So it's important to just get a gauge of really how someone's been in maybe the last week or so. What's your biggest work stressor? What are your biggest personal stressors? Talk about that. When you think about the pandemic, what are you feeling? It doesn't have to be pandemic. It could be when you're thinking about racial tensions right now. What are you feeling? Let's talk about your feelings. Um, and what have you done for self-care today? Right, that's so important. Um, I've kind of, I know it sounds bad, but I've kind of trained my husband to ask that question on a daily basis. So he'll look at me and say like, well, what have you done for self-care? And sometimes I shrug him off, I'm like, eh, eh you and your self-care, but it's so critical and I realize how right he is. So you, sometimes you need somebody to ask you, what have you done for self-care? And don't forget to validate and summarize. So now if you're a manager, you gotta support your employees, right? They need you. They need to know that you're there. Um, they need to know that you're ready to listen, ready to support, ready to jump in. So if you're a manager, what can you do? You can communicate. You can focus on skill sets and supervision. And I won't read through all of these, but it's important to over communicate. I don't know how many times I've heard even students say, well, I feel like that was communicated at the very last minute. And so I tried my best to do the thing that I was asked to do, but it, I didn't have enough time or employees just trying to look for updates and they don't get them until the last minute. So, it's okay to just over communicate as much as possible. Um, even if there's no new news, state that. People just wanna know that you're looking out for them. Be vulnerable, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Uh, when you're vulnerable and sharing how you feel, then your employees are gonna soften a little bit and feel like you're someone that they can trust, right? Establish safety. Um, block an hour on your schedule for a week, each week for wellness. So if you do it, you're like, I'm gonna take this hour and I'm gonna read or I'm gonna have a lunch with my family member. Or I'm gonna go for a walk. You're setting the example and you're letting your employees know that their wellness is very important to you during this time. Uh, the skills. So if you're in office, have a coping table if that's possible. Uh, so that could be like coloring sheets, which I know sound juvenile, but they're so soothing. Uh, have journal pages and somebody just needs to jot down some notes. Um, have some gum, have stress balls, have affirmations for them, any other snacks, just something to let them know that I see you, this is hard work, I appreciate you, we'll talk about it. Uh, if you can bring in consultants, um, maybe to take like a pulse survey, so that way you understand how are your employees feeling maybe every quarter, every few months, just to see what they're needing. Um, and then supervision. So I like to think of supervision like clinical supervision, because what that is, is it gives your employees a chance to share what's been good, share what their struggles are, and give them a chance to ask you for support or say like, this is what I need. And you can say, this is how I can support you. So if you can offer flex time scheduling, if they need some quieter time uh, that they don't have during the day and you know they're gonna get their work done at night, if you can offer that, please offer that for them. Um, if they have a trauma caseload, help them balance that trauma caseload. You don't need to have one person in the office who does the trauma work and everybody else does the easier work. If that's the type of work you do, especially with students, make sure you can balance that out some. Um, and assess distress with some of those same skills and tools we've given you before. That's going to be so important. So 
So to jump off the same and similar umbrella as Lexi, um, I think that ways managers can help is to communicate, advocate, and appreciate. This is your time to work on your leadership skills and to figure out what your staff and team need and to evolve yourself as a leader. So some things you can do with communication, reestablish purpose and goals. Things could have changed during this time. Um, what are the goals and purpose of your institution or your team? What it helps us all realize, are we on the same track? Are we on the same mindset? Um, be transparent about those changes and shifts and plans, explain them. Share power and decision-making. That promotes collaboration. That helps us realize that we are a team and we are together. All right, everybody, we need to figure out how are we gonna change our business operations? How are we gonna change our opening plan? What does everyone think? Lexi, why don't you be in charge of creating a small team member uh, group so that we can all get everyone's ideas and suggestions? That helps Lexi with her leadership. It helps me communicate in terms of what's expected and our purpose and our goals. And it helps me develop another employee. Um, advocate, reassess and repri reprioritize. Because at this time, maybe we don't need to be doing everything that we used to do last year during this time. Maybe there are projects that can be taken off the table. Maybe we can adjust timing. We just adjusted some of our quarterly reports. We used to do them quarterly for our budget and we realized let's do this biannually because we know that you need the time. Um, and also how often do we need to be doing some of our projects? What can we take off the plate? Because that helps your staff do what they can during this time. It helps your staff understand what is important where do I need to put my time and energy? Because we only have so much energy during this time. We are still in the middle of a traumatic pandemic. We're still dealing with so many different areas of our wellness being affected. And you as the leader, understanding that and adjusting and adapting helps your team believe in you, follow you, and helps you you know, reach your purpose and goals together. Um, do hold staff accountable because it helps everyone being held to the same standard with some understanding, of course, but holding everyone accountable helps with consistency, keeps those guidelines and expectations and standards. It also is a way of being grounded because I know if my boss said I shouldn't be in the office, you know, I should be in the office by 9 a.m. And they're like, oh, that's okay. I know I'm gonna push it and push it and push it. It helps me take care of myself knowing that we're all held to the same expectation with understanding, of course, but it helps a lot. Also, um, Lexi did mention this and she kept talking about consultants. Yes, train staff on the skills that they need to be successful. This is huge. I did not know anything about WebEx, Zoom. I was not an expert in it. I, you know, Excel, Google Drive, how to build community virtually. There are consultants, there are experts in these fields. Bring them in, talk to your friends, talk, ask people in this group. Uh, any of us can come in, whether it's, how to help with self-care. This is a great place to start. And I know budget can be a concern, but there are a lot of us that can, you know, help and come in just to promote. We understand where everyone is struggling at the same time, but bring in people and ask for training if your staff is gonna be asked to do a new task or skill. So help your staff be successful in this new area that they're in. And lastly, appreciate. Keep a list of team and individual accomplishments. This helps with, you know, whether your resume, recognition, job security, evaluations. I know during this time we've been asked, let, list all the things that we've had to do in response to the pandemic. Um, also acknowledge exceptional work, but also acknowledge, acknowledge that mundane work. Just showing up, just dealing with the same caseload, the same workload is a lot. We're doing flu clinics now. We don't have the same number of students this year than we did last year. Why? Because obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic, but you know what? We're doing a great job. Acknowledge what your team is doing. Recognize their energy, recognize their work, and recognize your own work because you're all doing amazing. And just being here on this webinar shows how much you do care about your colleagues and yourself and your staff. Um, Elevate the mood, energize the vibe. I know we talked about that toxic positivity, but it is okay to keep things fun, stress-free. Um, you know, do a restorative, restorative practice in the beginning of your meetings, doing an icebreaker. That always sets the mood um, just a little bit better. It helps with the self-care, helps with the support and appreciation. Um, don't tell your staff to take care of themselves and then assign them like a last minute project over the weekend. 
So do practice, you know, what we're preaching. It does help. Um, whether that's sending appreciation packages to your staff members. Um, I ask my staff during our group me messages, all right, put a funny meme or a funny gif or share what's working for you right now. Um, also doing maybe an of the week um, or a kudos, you know, part of your meeting. So um, does anybody have any shout outs? And we try to do that at the end of all of our meetings. So whether that's a staff member really helped me out or they heard my concerns and that made me feel appreciated allowing your staff to have the time to appreciate self that culture of support culture of healing and just culture of recognition and realizing that you matter our team matters and um hopefully overall with these tips that'll help you support your team better okay now that you have supported yourself you've supported your team, you've supported your peers, you've supported your students, now what? This is in collective trauma, in crisis, I think it's very important to also state that you cannot make meaning of anything until you were out of the event. So again, if you're experiencing crisis or collective trauma, you cannot make meaning of it until you're out of it, until there is a sense of safety. So, just take a breath because we're all in this collective trauma together right now. So there, there's not much you're going to do just yet. Um, but if there's something that's happening on your campus or directly like a, a crisis and you can get past it, take a moment to just understand what happened. So maybe having a team meeting, coming together, identify your feelings. So how did you feel about it? Um, our students are, are absolutely taxed right now. Um, they're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed with Zoom. They're not understanding the content. Um, and so that comes into your office and then you start to feel that. And, and then what happens? Our students are constantly in crisis. My clients are sometimes in crisis. So I have to identify how I feel about it first. And also I have to evaluate my role. So evaluate your role. Again, do this after. Um, so what role did you play? And could you have done something differently? Not anything better, but just differently. How could you have assessed something differently? who could you have asked to help more, right? Sometimes we have trouble asking for help. Um, and so being able to validate yourself, understand how you felt, understand what your role was, um, talk about it, right? Or even journal about it. What have you learned? So how we make meaning is you can journal, you can donate, um, you might be reading, you might meditate. Those are all ways of making meaning. It doesn't have to be something huge, but when you're ready for that, reach out to someone who might be able to help you through that process as well. So Como and I have, are leaving you with just a few resources today. Uh, some things we talked about, um, maybe some books to, if you have time, because I know everybody's pressed for time. And so the book might not be the first thing you go to. Um, so we also included some articles, uh, that risk assessment uh, rubric I talked about earlier, just so you have something to walk away with when you get a copy of the slides, because um, you want to be sure you're still trying to do the work as much as you can with the few resources that you have and the, the little bit of time that you have. And it's our contact information, you know how to get in touch with us at any time. Um, again, we've talked about today how to support yourself, how to support your students, how to support your colleagues, how to, if you're a manager, how do you support your employees, um, and when you're ready, and only when you're ready and that trauma has passed, can you make meaning of it and go through that process. Um, so now um, I'm going to see if Sana wants to come back and join us, and, and Komal can join us, and I haven't had a chance to dive into the chat, so I kind of want to do that. I'm, I'm, Feeling like I want to see what everybody's sharing, um, especially since we did ask you to share in the chat. So tell us what you liked the most out of this presentation, what resonated with you. I love the ideas because I'm totally going back to read this chat because you all had some amazing tips for us as well. Um, and thank you for your time. Lexi, will you go to the next slide very quickly? I'm just going to share with our um, 
attendees here, if you have to head out early, remember to do the survey. It'll pop up automatically when you exit the Zoom room. But we're not done with our webinar series. We have two more parts. Part three is going to be in November. We're going to talk about beyond book clubs and lip service, actionable allyship in the workplace. This is purposely after the election because the work continues, the allyship continues, election season or not. So we hope you'll come to that. Part four is towards healing. We'll have a community meditation and trauma uh, conscious and informed um, breathing and yoga session that'll be interactive to close out our series and to close out the year. Uh, so Lexi, if you'll stop sharing the slide deck so we can all come up here. We had several amazing comments um, here and it was so great to hear so from so many of you. There was one question that was sent in the chat. So I'm trying to come back to it. If you give me a moment, and also if you still have questions, please send them in the Q and A. Um, yes, okay, found it. Okay, so this question was related to how do you show up for your colleagues when you are a the only person of color or one of the only people of color in your office, and it is not business as usual for you. So you are hurting and you're struggling, and how do you then show up for your colleagues who may not be aware of your the racial trauma you are experiencing, who may not be as in tune with what's going on in your home because you're the manager. Uh, so what recommendation would you have for this individual? So if you, so I'm understanding, right? You're the manager and you're trying to show up. Is it for your employees or colleagues or both? Maybe both? Didn't specify, but this is a, a okay. manager who is a person of color and one of the only ones in the, I guess, organization. Okay. Um, well, first, I definitely think it's important that you have someone. So even if you're not in therapy, find a therapist. Uh, we can definitely help you with that. Um, or even just another peer to kind of offload what you are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, when it comes to then supporting, let's say it's your employees or, or your colleagues, and you are, the, you are the only one, I very much understand what that is like. Um, and on many occasions, I have told people that Google is free. So if they are coming to you with questions, if they're coming to you because they, they don't know how to support others and they're tired and they don't know how to make that change happen, it is not up to you to make that change happen. It is not your responsibility to ensure that they are understanding their feelings and sorting through their feelings there, you can, you can ask them some very general questions, right? You can still support them. Um, you can still validate, you can still understand. Um, but then when it tips into that like boundary, so that's gonna be a personal boundary of yours. Um, remember how important it is to set that boundary. You're gonna have to let them know that this is something that is, that is feeling very personal for me right now. And I'm not sure that I have the emotional bandwidth to help support you during this time. But I am more than happy to help you find someone if you're needing to talk this through um, or help provide you with resources. So again, remember we've talked about having a resource list so you don't have to do it yourself because that is not your job. Again, Google is free. I don't know how many websites I've seen that talk about how to support yourself during racial trauma, um, really specific to, to allies or those that are saying they are actionable allies. Um, then lead them there and say, you know, I'm not really ready to have this discussion, but I'm happy to help support you in other ways. Because that can feel very personal and you absolutely don't have to, you don't have to share that information. A follow-up question to that, Lexi, is as a manager, how do you manage self-disclosure to share struggles versus making your employees feel like you're talking about yourself or you're making things about yourself? Um, how do you balance that? And again, if you have to head out, we understand we're just a couple minutes away from the hour. We want to get through a few more of these questions. So we'll be here, uh, here to chat and to discuss and answer these questions. If you have to head out, remember to take the survey and we'll be sending you the recording and slide deck too. Um, I think self-disclosure, some amount of self-disclosure is important because that's part of vulnerability and that helps your employees or your colleagues understand where you're coming from. Um, you don't have to share the full story. You kind of share what you feel comfortable with at that time. Uh, you share what you need. But um, like I said, some amount of self-disclosure just really can, can help your employees or your colleagues connect in with you. Um, they can maybe validate or they can provide um, some empathy. 
this is not a time where we have to be as concerned, right? If, if you're a therapist like myself, I have to hold space for people. So there's a little bit of a difference and understanding too, there's always a power differential, but you're still a human being. Um, if you're a person of color, then that is also part of your everyday experience in terms of how you breathe, how you eat, how you survive. And we can't just compartmentalize that and pretend that everything is okay. So I think it's absolutely okay to talk a little bit, see how people respond. And then you'll kind of have a sense of when people start to, to zone out or when they're not as plugged in or if they get this look of shock on their face and say, you know, um, I appreciate you listening to that little bit that I was able to share just now. Um, so why don't you share with me how you're uh, feeling or what you're experiencing right now? Thank you. Our, the next question we have is how do we support our superiors? So I think, how do we support our managers or maybe those in senior leadership is what that question is going on. And Komal, I saw you unmuted. So you want to go for this one? I'm very thankful to the participant that asked that question um, because it shows a sense of being aware of your team and your superiors are always hopefully supporting you and providing opportunity for your growth and your you know safety. Um, and as a supervisor, it is uncommon sometimes for my staff to check in and I realize that they've been doing it more and it matters a lot because um, it helps us. We don't know what we're doing sometimes. I'm being very honest. As a supervisor, we are also in a similar boat. So the fact that you're seeing us as you know, a person as well helps with that teamwork. Simple things as how are you doing today? Have you taken care of yourself? My staff has left me little sticky notes that thank you for all you do. Um, I'm going out to grab something to eat. Can I get you something? How has this been going for you? Just that simple check-in helps. Um, what I've done actually for here at our Dean of Students, I walked and I said, you know, you're doing a lot. What can I take off your plate? What can I help with? I have some extra time this week. Is there any project that you need assistance with? Um, just as simple as asking what you can do or checking in to see how they are. The same type of tips and that you would utilize to check in with your colleagues or your students also apply to your supervisors. So yeah, please do that. It is very, um, appreciated across the board, checking in above you, your peers, as well as anyone that you supervise. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Komal, for that. So we're right at time. We're going to wrap up. Um, I think we were able to get through all of the main questions or we summed it up. Um, there is an anonymous uh, comment about um, if Lexi is seeing patients during this pandemic. Um, yes, her contact information is on the slide deck and it'll be included in the email. So you'll be able to find that directly. Um, if you, if you need it urgently, I sent you an email reminder. Actually, let me type my email in here. Um, you get all your webinar emails from me, but in case you missed it, I put my email in the chat. Uh, feel free to reach out to me and I'll get you connected to Lexi right away. Um, so y'all, election is around the corner, pandemic is ongoing, we're still experiencing all of the things that we talked about today. Our sincere hope for you is that you um, find time to care for yourself, uh, to pour into yourself before you pour to others, to um, set your boundaries and to uh, get off that 24 hour newsreel if you need to, um, because it can be also very toxic as I have found out personally myself. Um, but we, we hope to see you next time. Uh, we'll, we'll see you in November. We're gonna talk about actionable allyship and, and what it means to support our colleagues um, more intentionally uh, during this time. But thank you again for being here. I mean, this has been such a great uh, opportunity for us to hold space for you. It's such an honor and privilege. And we hope to continue to breathe with you, to meditate with you, to reflect with you. And we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody. Take care. Don't forget Bye. to fill out the survey when you exit. Bye.